All right, there's a couple of main points we're just going to hit on tonight in Galatians chapter 5. The big one being circumcision. Now, this topic has come up a couple times through the book of Galatians. And remember, as we went through this, this book, each chapter, we're on, we're on chapter 5 now. We've gone through the first four chapters. And he's really, the Apostle Paul is really um, hitting home with salvation and how it's completely by grace. It's not of works. And, um, you know, you're... You're a Jew, which was one inwardly, and you know if you're if you're saved by the works of the law, then Christ profits you nothing. You know all these great verses and great teachings that we've gotten up to this point, but this was kind of the um, one of the big problems that was going on at this time was this reliance on or this belief that circumcision was a requirement, that it's necessary. Now, keep your place here. We're going to turn back to Genesis chapter 17, and I just want to show you why they were so stuck on this concept of having to get circumcised. Why, why was this such a big deal to them? Because today, for us, it's not a big deal. And a little bit later in the sermon, I'm going to cover you know, whether or not we as Christians should be practicing circumcision with our own children. Now, right off the bat, I think it's kind of interesting that they would even that anyone would believe that circumcision was a requirement for salvation because does that mean that women don't get saved then or what? Because <laughs> circumcision is applied to males, to men. Or is salvation different for men than for women? I don't know. I mean, it's one of those dilemmas like, I, I, don't, I don't know how you could reconcile salvation when you are believing that a work of the flesh, like being circumcised, would be a requirement. But there, it, it, it was a very important thing that was done. And for a very long period of time for the Hebrews... And this is one of the things that they did that separated them from the rest of the world, from the rest of the unbelieving world. This is something that physically separated them and, and made them a different people, one of the things. And it was designed to do that. It was supposed to, you know, there's a lot of meaning behind it. But what we're going to go back to Genesis 17. We're going to look at some of the language here. And, and you could get a little bit of understanding. Okay, I can see how people get a little bit confused about this just because it is a big deal. Just like people today get confused about other aspects of our Christian life, you know, baptism or something like that, you can say, yeah, I could kind of see, you know, even though they're way off, you could kind of see how they get a little bit screwed up on something. So, but we're going we're gonna to take a look at this. This is when circumcision was instituted as a thing for, you know, by God for a group of people. Now, I also want to mention this too real quick. This isn't even in my notes, but... There are people today, now I don't believe in circumcision. We're going to get into that, like I said, a little bit later for a Christian family. You know, I didn't circumcise any of either of my boys. But it's not because I think it's some barbaric practice of mutilation of a, a, a child's body. I don't believe that because if that were the case, God would never have instituted it ever. If it was some horrible, barbaric practice that no one should ever do. Okay, that is ridiculous, and, and it's a, it makes me sick to see even people who profess faith in Christ and belief in God's word to, to go to these extremes because they see this other culture, this non-Christian culture, you know, promoting this. There's, you know, there's people who are into homeschooling, and it's almost like a, a newer hippie type of movement, but it's not quite as, as, as weird as, as the hippie movement was. But just this real natural, and look, we're all, I'm all for eating organic and doing things naturally and doing home births and homeschooling and doing all this stuff, right? It's great. But there's a culture that is, that is doing it for reasons completely outside of the Bible, just because they think that's the way things should be. And this is one of those things that has a tendency to go along with people in that movement where they believe that circumcision is just so horrible and bad and you shouldn't do this to your kids and everything else because it's just, it's just unconscionable that anyone would do this. And that's wrong. Because, like I said, God wouldn't have ever instituted it if it was that bad of a thing to do. Okay? Now, on the other hand, you have people who say you must do it because it's a benefit to the child. If you don't do it, they're going to have all these problems. And, and that, no, it's something that, that medically and, and modern science tells us that the, you know, a child should be circumcised. But, you know, it's like, I don't buy that either. 
Because God didn't make us imperfect in any way, shape, or form. That's why we don't need to go get vaccinated. That's why we don't need, you know, as soon as a, the child's coming out of the womb, oh, we have to do all these things, for, you know, because God didn't do a good enough job with his creation preparing us to survive in this world. Baloney. Not true. Okay? A child doesn't, a male child doesn't need to be circumcised. Because look, he didn't even institute it until Abraham. And then he did away with it in the New Testament. So it's not something that, is, that for any reason needs to be done today at all. Now look, if you do that with your children, I don't care. <laughs> this has nothing to do, you know, like, I'm not going to hold anything against anyone, but just make sure, you know, you do whatever you want to do for your reasons, but don't think that the Bible is commanding you to do such a thing or, um, you know, anything like that. You want to do it for other reasons, you think it's great medically, Go ahead. I don't, I don't care. You know, whatever. But we're going to take a look and see what the Bible has to say about circumcision tonight because that's what really matters anyways. Let's, so we're going to start reading here in Genesis chapter 17. Look at verse number 7. The Bible says, And I will establish my covenant between me and thee, this is God basically speaking to Abraham, and thy seed after thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant, to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant therefore, thou and thy seed after thee in their generations. This is my covenant which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee, Every man child among you shall be circumcised, and ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you, every man child in your generations, and he that is born in the house, or bought with money of any stranger which is not of thy seed, he that is born in thy house, and he that is bought with thy money, must needs be circumcised, and my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised man-child, whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, look at this, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He hath broken my covenant. So pretty strong words, a pretty strong language. You're saying, look, your men need to be circumcised, and if you're not circumcised, that soul is going to be cut off. So you can see why, and for, for hundreds of years, this continues and is part of their culture. And rightfully so, this is what God wanted to do. It was a, a symbol, but it's important because he said that this is a token. This is just a token. This is, this is symbolic what's going on here. It's representative. Now, many things that were symbolic and were representing other truths were still required by God for them to do. Just like the animal sacrifices, the Passover lamb, and, and all the others. Look, they were all symbolic. They didn't wash away their sins. They had a greater meaning, but they still had to do it. It was still part of the law. And circumcision also became part of God's law and was a requirement for them to do, even though it's still symbolic. Okay. Um, we saw that the teaching of... Ma so go ahead and turn, if you would now, to Acts chapter 15. And then we'll go back to Galatians. Basically, we see God makes his covenant with Abraham, right? God makes a promise that he's going to bless Abraham and that, and that his seed is going to be blessed. And he, and he makes a promise that he's going to give him land of Canaan for an everlasting possession. And this is one of those passages, and I'm not going to really get into that real much, real deep, but where people say, see, no, this, Israel needs to be in this land because God gave it to them. It's an everlasting, but, you know, all this stuff. And um, the promise is still going to be fulfilled to Israel or to Abraham's seed, Right? But who is Abraham's seed? And we covered that already in Galatians chapter 3. You know, we are Abraham's seed if we're in Abraham. And this will be fulfilled as well where God gives uh, that area, that land, for an everlasting habitation. Now, um, I also believe that this, these, these covenants have been broken because God gave covenants in the Old Testament that was dependent on them 
keeping God's law and, and doing these things, which was broken. So when the covenant's broken, God doesn't have to keep his end of the deal when you break your end of the deal, right? It's the way a covenant works. But um, in any case, like I said, I don't really want to get into the whole Israel thing tonight because I really want to cover circumcision, uh, even though this has, you know, they're still very closely related. We saw Genesis 17, God talking to Abraham. He gives them this, you know, tell them you have to do this and anyone who's not, any male child that's not circumcised is going to be cut off from his people. So strong language. It's very important. Something that God wants them to do. They're going to put a difference between themselves and the rest of the world and their, their male children are going to be circumcised. Now in Acts chapter 15, I covered this a few weeks ago. I, I, I touched on it. This was one of the places where in the New Testament church, there were people trying to come in and teach and add works to salvation. They're trying to come in and say, no, you know, circumcision is necessary. And this is different church than the churches in Galatia, which is what we're in tonight in Galatians. Acts chapter 15, verse number one. The Bible says, And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. Now, we're not going to read this whole chapter. You could do it later, but you see this is where Paul and Barnabas were like, uh, no, that's not the case. And they didn't give place to them, no, not for an hour. He didn't give them any time. It was just like, no, you're saved by grace. It has nothing to do with, with circumcision. But they're saying, hey, unless you're circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. And that's heresy. That's completely false. And these people were trying to bring in this damnable heresy. They're trying to bring the people back into bondage. Because they're trying to bring the law back in the salvation. They're just saying, no, the law brings bondage. No one could follow the law. If, you can't, you know, if you're going to follow any point of the law, you have to follow all of the law. And good luck with that because no one's been able to keep that. That's why salvation comes by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. So um, jump down to verse 24 there in Acts 15. This is kind of their conclusion. We saw in verse 1, people were bringing this in and they're making this claim and saying, you need to be circumcised in order to be saved. Verse 24 says, For as much as we have heard that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your souls, saying you must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment. So this is after they go to Jerusalem and they're talking to the apostles and other people and they're saying, look, we didn't send these guys out to teach this, this false doctrine. We gave them no commandment that says you've got to keep the law also in order to be saved. He said, you know, no. And, and what happens when people do that, they are subverting souls. They're causing a lot of problems. And this is the same problem that's going on in the churches of Galatia. Someone went in there and was teaching the law and teaching Moses and teaching circumcision, saying you have to have this or else you're not even saved. And they're going in there and probably quoting verses like Genesis 17, 14, saying that like, you know, any man child whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people and teaching, see, you need circumcision to be saved. And, 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 and twisting scripture to say something and to mean something that it really wasn't um, intended out because that's, you know, that verse that we read in Genesis 17, that's not talking about your soul being saved. That's all about physically. That's a physical punishment, something physically that happened if you don't c keep God's law physically. But what God really cares about is the soul. Now, let's get started here in, in Galatians chapter 5. Because this is, this is the same problem that, that was happening in Acts chapter 15, but it's already been settled. In Acts 15, at least, you know, they're saying that, you know, of course not. Of course you don't need to be circumcised. Galatians 5 verse 1 says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. And, you know, and that's the theme. That's, that is the good news. Hey, Christ has made us free. Let's stand fast in that liberty then. Let's not start adding other requirements. As I was trying to explain, my, try my best to explain while I was soul winning earlier this afternoon, to a girl who is, who is a Catholic and trying to explain, look, let's not add, you know, what Christ did is enough. Christ made us free. Hey, Christ paid for all of our sins. We don't have to add confession of our sins and partaking in Holy Communion and, and doing all these other things and baptism. And, you know, Jesus doesn't need any of that in addition to what he did 
to give us liberty, to make us free from the penalty of our sins. He did everything, and that's enough. And what you're doing when you start adding in these works is you're bringing yourself back into bondage. And people who want to do that, I mean, I don't even believe they're actually ever got saved to begin with. And that's why the Apostle Paul, as I've mentioned already multiple times, keeps on saying, hey, I stand in question of you. Like, I think I've worked in vain here because how could you possibly think that you need any other works of the flesh to be added in order for people to be saved and that Christ isn't enough? And, and that's why over and over again you see the Apostle Paul just standing in doubt of them. Uh, verse number, or let's keep reading our verse number one. I didn't even finish the, the verse. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. Nothing. See, when people want to add works, they say, yeah, but I already believe in Jesus. And, and so many people say, but I believe in Jesus, so doesn't that make me saved? Well, no, not if you're also believing in all of these other works in addition to that faith in Christ. That does not make you saved. That actually, Christ profits you nothing. And this verse is a perfect example of that. If you, basically, what he's saying is that if you need to be circumcised, then Christ isn't doing anything for you because you've muddied the waters, you've changed the, the faith-only salvation into a works-based salvation, therefore nullifying any benefit you would get from saying that you believe in Christ because God requires you to believe on Christ with all of your heart, all of it, not 90% of it or 99% or 99.9%, .9 but still hold on to some other work or some other, you know, obedience to God's law. No, it has to all be on Christ. It's all or nothing. And when you start adding the works in, you've got nothing. Christ profits you nothing. Verse 3, for I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. He's saying, you want to add circumcision? You say, that's the only other thing you have to do? Well, guess what? That's, that is one aspect of the law, and you have to do all of the law now because you can't just pick and choose one part of the law and say, well, you have to follow this part of the law. But so many people want to do that. Even Baptists will say, well, if you're still drinking, then you're not saved. If you're doing, you know, it's like, Okay, what part of the law are you going to add to Christ's free gift of salvation? Then you just have to keep all of the law. Pharisee, keep it all. You're going to tell people they're not saved if they're still going to drink or they're still going to fornicate or something like that. Don't be entangled again with the bondage. Now look, we need to stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. Now we ought to not get entangled again with bondage of sin. Of course, we should live righteously because we've already been freed from that bondage. But that's not what, you know, that obedience to God's law doesn't save anybody and is not required for salvation in any way, shape, or form. Now, what I like about this, to flip, keep your place here in Galatians 5, flip over to Romans chapter 2. Galatians and Roman have, Romans have a lot of overlapping doctrines, a lot of things that teach the same things. When it comes to the Jews and being Israel, who Israel is, Romans has lots and lots of passages on this as well as Galatians. So you, you can kind of use both of these books together to support a lot of the same exact doctrine and find things worded almost identically. So when he said here that... For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Look at Romans 2, verse number 25. It's almost the same exact phrase found. For circumcision verily profiteth if thou keep the law, but if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. Therefore, if the uncircumcision keep the righteousness of the law, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? And shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, judge thee who by the letter and circumcision doth transgress the law? So he's basically saying, you need to keep the whole law. He says, the only way circumcision is going to profit you is if you can keep all of God's law, right? then yes, it will profit you. If, you. if you can keep God's law perfectly, then go ahead, get circumcised, and follow every single other commandment if that's what you're going to rely on to get you to heaven. Good luck with that. But he says, but if you're a breaker of the law 
And as 1 John chapter 1 says that, you know, if you say that you are without sin, you de you're basically you're deceiving yourself and the truth is not in you. Okay, I know I didn't quote that exactly right, but go ahead and look it up for yourself. 1 John chapter 1, verses like 8 through 10. If you, if you are not confessing that you're a sinner, if you think that you're perfect, then you are a liar. The truth's not in you. And uh, the Bible says here, if you're a breaker of the law, well, now all of a sudden your circumcision is made uncircumcision. That Basically, that circumcision isn't going to profit you anything. It's just as if you're uncircumcised because you've already broken the law. You've already broken other aspects of the law. Look, if that's going to profit you anything, you need to keep all the law. And of course, this is still in the context of you know, trusting in, in the law or whatever, you know, or versus faith for your salvation. Look at verse number 28 there in Romans chapter 2. For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter whose praise is not of men, but of God. Let's keep reading here in chapter 3, verse number 1. What advantage then hath the Jew, or what profit is there of circumcision? Much every way, chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. So basically, in chapter 2, he gets, at the end of the chapter, he gets done saying, look, God is not caring about the physical Jews. He's saying you're not a Jew, which is one outwardly with, with, with the, the keeping of the law and, and the circumcising of the flesh, you know, being in Hebrew. He says that's not what makes you a Jew. What makes you a Jew is what's on the inside. That's what makes someone a Jew in God's eyes. And circumcision is that of the heart. So the circumcision that matters isn't the outward flesh circumcision. What God's looking at is the heart. He wants your heart because what is it? I mean, circumcision is literally the removing of foreskin. So there's a covering over your heart, something that's kind of keeping your heart from, from loving God and accepting God. That needs to be removed. That needs to be cut away so your heart is opened up to God. That's what he wants. I mean, symbolically, metaphorically, that's what he's talking about. And that's the circumcision that he cares about is what's on the inside, not the outward appearance of the flesh. He says his circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter whose praise is not of men, but of God. And then he goes on to say, well, what advantage then hath the Jew or what profit is there of circumcision? He said, well, well, then what's the big deal about there even being a Jew? He said, there is a profit to being a Jew, especially at this time. There was a, he says, much every way. There is profit in that. But why? He says, chiefly because that unto them, and, this is, and he goes back to talking about the physical Jews, right? He says, you're not a Jew hourly. You know, the physical Jew doesn't matter. It's, it's inwardly. But the physical Jews did have a benefit. There was a benefit to being born in Israel and to being a Jew and to receiving circumcision. Why? Because that's who God used to commit the oracles of God. They're the ones who received the words of God. So doesn't it just make sense that, yeah, it would profit you to be born into a nation, unto a people that had God's word being promoted, that were trying to follow God's laws? Of course, there's a value to that. There, there's many reasons why that's a good thing. Just like today, there is a value to someone being born into a Christian home. That's great. That's a great benefit. You're going to hear God's word. You're going to have a, a, a much better head start. So there was an advantage to being a Jew at that time because God was only using the Jews basically to be his mouthpiece. He was revealing his words unto the Jews. And they were the lighthouse for all the nations to come to and to join themselves to be a part of Israel and to be a part of God's word. But that was the benefit. And that's all this is saying. There's no other benefit than that because what God really cares about anyways, as far as you being a Jew, is on the inside. The circumcision of the heart. Not all the outward stuff. What really matters is the internal. Chapter 4. We're in Romans 3. Just flip over to Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4, verse number 8. The Bible says, Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. And this is quoting from, uh, from David, from the book of Psalms. 
And earlier in the beginning of the chapter, it talks about Abraham, right? It talks about how Abraham was justified by faith and not of works. And again, Romans 4, excellent chapter to disprove to anybody that believes that salvation was any other way than by grace through faith. It was never of the works of the law. It was impossible for people to be saved through the blood of bulls and of goats. They can't redeem you. They can't sanctify you. It's always been by grace through faith. It was with Abraham. It was by David. And here we're going to see... Um, it's going to explain a little bit more about circumcision and why circumcision outwardly in the flesh isn't that important and that's not what it's all about and definitely not why it's, one, it's something that would be needed for salvation. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Verse number nine, cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only or upon the uncircumcision also? For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. So he's saying, Hey, we already said that faith was reckoned to Abraham, that that's what made him righteous. So is this blessedness, the blessedness of the Lord not imputing sin, the blessedness of faithful Abraham, does this only then apply to the circumcision, to the Jews? Or does it also apply to the uncircumcision? Well, he answers this, verse number 10. Well, how was it then reckoned? Basically, well, how was it reckoned when Abraham received it? How did he get it? When he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? When, when Abraham received the sign of circumcision at all, he was uncircumcised himself. Yet God gave him the gift. God already made the promise to him first when he was uncircumcised. He received grace as an uncircumcised person and then was given circumcision, not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had yet being uncircumcised. So he's saying, of course the uncircumcised people of the world can receive this blessedness because Abraham was uncircumcised when he received it, and the, and the circumcision itself was a sign of his faith. That's why he got it anyways. That's why God gave him that seal of circumcision, because of his faith. So the uncircumcised world can also receive the same blessedness from God of forgiveness of sins because it's not by the outward work of the flesh, but the belief in your heart. Let's finish up here in Romans 4, um, verse number 11. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had being yet uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. And the father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, but who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had being yet uncircumcised. For the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Just completely destroying any notion or concept of, their, of, of circumcision being a requirement at all in any way, shape, or form in regards to salvation. Just not at all. He said, that's a work of the law. And, and the promise was made through the righteousness of faith, not through keeping of the law. There's so much scripture dedicated, just completely devoted to separating these concepts of salvation, what we need for our souls to be saved, being completely through faith, only by the grace of God, versus our obedience to God's law. Because, let's face it, both things are very important. Of course our salvation is important. That goes without saying. But obedience to God's law is also a very important thing. God didn't give commandments for no reason. These are still things he expects us to follow as far as commandments go, as far as what has not already been fulfilled. Because we know that Jesus Christ didn't come to destroy the law, but to fulfill. So all the aspects of God's law that have been fulfilled through Christ to this point are no longer part of the law that needs to be followed. Right? This is why we don't offer animal sacrifice. Christ 
fulfilled that being the sacrifice once for all. Circumcision, also this, this seal, the promise that was given on Abraham, this was also now fulfilled. Because we have all the scripture saying that circumcision doesn't mean anything in Christ anymore. And what he really cares about, which is what God has always cared about, by the way, and we're going to see this. Um, I've got a few references that just in, in a few minutes. What God has always cared about is the circumcision of the heart. Now, the flesh, circumcision is part of the law. I'm not saying it didn't matter, because it did matter. Otherwise, it, God wouldn't have had it in there. But what, what it symbolized and what was really the most important thing was that of the heart. It's, it's a weightier matter. Just like when Jesus said to the, to, the, to the Pharisees, you know, they were tithing on mint and rue and anise and cumin. And, and he says, yeah, you, you did right by doing that, but you've omitted the weightier matters of the law and judgment and, you know, and, and all these things. He said, you totally just left out the most important things. And you're just doing these little things. But um, Circumcision, the, the outward one is more of a little thing. Yeah, you should, they should be doing that. But the, the, the weightier matter is that the circumcision of your heart, right? And, and opening up your heart to God. Um, turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, because I'm going to answer the question, should we as Christians circumcise our children? Well, we already saw in Galatians 5 verse number 2, Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. Don't let that verse go void. I mean, if, if we as Christians ought to circumcise our male children, then why would he say, I mean, think about that. If you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. Now look, I'm not trying to rip this out of context. He's obviously referring to if that's what you're trusting in. Right? If you're trusting in that you need that to be saved, of course, Christ will profit you nothing. But the statement itself is just kind of, you know, like if you're circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing, should still kind of hit home a little bit and say, well, let me rethink this. Do we need, do we, you know, should I be circumcising my child when we have verses like this in the Bible? But it gets even more clear. Look at uh, 1 Corinthians 7, verse number 18. Because ultimately, it doesn't matter. But the reason why I think we, we shouldn't even do it is because there's no purpose for it or no reason to. 1 Corinthians 7, 18 says, Is any man called being circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. Which obviously, there's, I mean, there's no way you could become uncircumcised anyways, to my knowledge. But he's, basically, he's just saying, though, it doesn't, you don't have to go and reverse your circumcision somehow if you're already circumcised because it doesn't matter. It says, is any called in uncircumcision? So you're called, you know, basically called me is, is referring to them being saved, right? You're getting saved. You're called. If you're circumcised, okay, well, you're not going to become uncircumcised. Is any called in uncircumcision? Let him not be circumcised. He's saying, don't get circumcised. If you're saved, okay, fine. You don't have to. And I look at that saying, well, my child is born in uncircumcision. Let him not be circumcised. I don't see any reason to do it because... It doesn't matter for his faith, that's for sure. It doesn't matter for, for whether or not he's going to heaven. I mean, it has nothing to do with it anyways. But let's not, um, you know, let's not worry about that. As he says in verse 19, circumcision is nothing. And uncircumcision is nothing but the keeping of the commandments of God. Let every man abide in the same calling wherein he was called. So, it was the keeping of the commandments of God to the Jews until the New Testament, right? That was, the, that was what they were supposed to do. But th he's very clearly saying, well, now if you're uncircumcised, you don't need to be circumcised. So what? He says, let every man just abide, just stay with it. If you're circumcised, great, stay circumcised. You're uncircumcised, great, stay uncircumcised. Doesn't mean anything. It doesn't, you, don't need to, you don't need to do that at all. Just go ahead and stay. Because he didn't say, oh, you're uncircumcised. Well, you're saved by faith, but you still should get circumcised because now you're a believer. He didn't say that. He says, just stay uncircumcised. Right? Because what, what do we say? And this is probably the, the closest thing that we have to circumcision is baptism. That people are always trying to add to be part of the works of salvation or things like that. 
Now, with baptism, when someone does get saved, we do say, you should get baptized now. And, this is, and baptism is something that was commanded by the disciples after people were saved. Hey, you're commanded to be baptized. But circumcision is not that way. They were not saying, okay, now you're saved, now you need to get circumcised. Baptism, in a way, has kind of replaced that symbolism of that seal of that covenant that was given to Abraham with the seal of the covenant through Jesus Christ. It, it, baptism is to, it, it, it basically, is, is almost the, 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 the New Testament version of circumcision. They're both symbolic and... and um, neither one was ever required for salvation. So I'm going to read, go back, go to, um, you could go back to Galatians chapter 5. I've got a bunch of references here. I'm just going to kind of read them pretty quickly. What circumcision was really about anyways. We read from Genesis 17. We saw where it was definitely something that God was serious about. But even in the Old Testament, we're going to see a lot of references of the circumcision of the heart is really what mattered to God. You know, even though the physical circumcision was part of the law, what, what, he, what it was really trying to demonstrate and hit home to them was the circumcision of the heart. Deuteronomy, you know, in multiple places in the Old Testament too. Deuteronomy 10, 16 says, Circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart and be no more stiff-necked. Jeremiah 4.4 4 says, Circumcise yourselves to the Lord and take away the foreskins of your heart. Ye men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, let my fear, lest my fury come forth like fire and burn that none can quench it because of the evil of your doings. He tell them again. Basically, it's repent, tear away the foreskin of your heart, get right with me so that my fury doesn't have to come upon you. That's what he cared about. They were all circumcised in the flesh at that time, but his fury was still going to come because they needed to circumcise the foreskin of their heart. That's what he cared about. That was what was going to prevent his destruction in the Old Testament. Romans 2.29, we already read this, but he is a Jew which is one inwardly and circumcision is that of the heart. Right? Philippians 3.3 says, for we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. He's saying that's who's the circumcision. It has nothing to do with your flesh. It's those that worship God in spirit and rejoice in Jesus Christ and have no confidence in the flesh or the works of the law or anything like that. That's who the circumcision is. So, and in this way, spiritually, men and women can both be circumcision, right? Because... It's in the heart. It doesn't matter. And, and again, that's what God cares about. Colossians chapter 2, verse 11 says, In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, not physically, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. That's what matters. Galatians 5. Let's keep reading here now. Verse number 4. Now, don't worry. I'm not going to take this much time. We're only on verse number 4. But that was a major point just trying to explain circumcision because it's come up a lot and I really wanted to make sure we got through a lot of scripture and that has just thoroughly gone through as much as I can on a Wednesday night. Um, because some people struggle with this, you know, and, and there's Christians who don't know and, you know, it, it's just been tradition or passed down where people think, well, no, you know, and there's a lot of people that I know that, I mean, there's a lot of guys that are just, they're circumcised these days. And it's for religious reasons. Because people just think that it's, it's something, you know, they're, they're, a lot of people are ignorant. They don't read the Bible for themselves. And it's just kind of the way things have been for a long time. And I, the Bible is very clear that it, ultimately it really doesn't matter. And the reason why we, I've chosen not to circumcise my children mostly is just because I don't want to perpetuate any false ideas of what circumcision is. And obviously it's something that most people won't even know anyways because <laughs> we're just, there, there's very few people that ought to know, you know, those, those details about you. But um, 
which again is another reference to like the, the circumcision of your heart and you know like God sees that and God knows your heart and everything else but um Let's keep going here. So let's, uh, there's like at least one more um, main point that I want to hit tonight. Galatians 5, verse number 4, Christ has become of no effect unto you, whosoever you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. Um, now this does not mean that someone can lose their salvation. Because I've heard people try to use this verse as passage to say, oh, see, you're fallen from grace. That means you had grace and now you don't have it anymore because you've fallen from grace. That's not what he's saying. If, you're if you believe you're justified by the law, Christ is of no effect unto you. And, and as I already mentioned before, I don't believe people who we're already truly saved are going to now all of a sudden change their mind and later and say, well, no, now we actually do need the law to be saved. I don't think you're ever saved to begin with. Because, what, I mean, there'd be, it just, it just kind of stupid, first of all. <laughs> like, there's no reason why would you, would you just all of a sudden add works to your free gift. If you've received the free gift, you know it's free. You've, you've put your faith in that free gift and all of a sudden, well, no, you actually need to do some other work. You didn't comprehend the free gift to begin with. So uh, that's, that's basically uh, what this is talking about here. But I'm gonna, I, I, that, this can literally be an entire sermon in and of itself, and I'm not going to get too deep into that one tonight. So the bottom line, though, is with the circumcision thing. You say, well, it's not that big of a deal today. You can substitute any work of the law with circumcision, anything. It doesn't matter what it is, whatever the commandment is, and it all is going to be the same. As I mentioned before, you know, people these days will try to include baptism instead of circumcision. And, and they'll go that route. And um, very, very clearly, I'm just going to give you one passage on this. One, my favorite passage to go to when people think you need to be baptized in order to be saved. Because they'll go to Mark 16 and say, you know, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be condemned. It's like, well, it says already, if you don't believe, you're condemned. It doesn't say anything about not being baptized. And the way it's worded is just, if you believe and you're baptized, you're saved. Well, yeah, if you believe and, and come to church, you're saved. If you believe and do anything, you're saved because you believe, right? I mean, that's what makes you saved. So um, there's no, um, there's no, re there's no, um, well, mine just went blank. There's no contradiction. Sorry, no contradiction in the scripture there. Because you have one passage that says believe and baptize, and every other one says believe. No, it's the belief that makes you saved. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, if you ever run across somebody, because it's usually like uh, Pentecostal churches that will teach that you need baptism for salvation. And 1 Corinthians 1 is a very easy place to show them because you could just say, well, hey, was Apostle Paul getting people saved? I mean, he's like the greatest evangelist that the world's ever known. Was the Apostle Paul getting people saved? I think he was. And this, because they always like to say, oh, there's all these different time periods. Say, what about the people on the cross? He didn't get baptized. Well, oh, that was a special case. Or, or that was still when Jesus was alive. And they want, you know, like they want to add all these other little caveats to now we need baptism to be saved. Okay. If now we need baptism to be saved, I mean, well, because Paul's pretty late in the New Testament, right? So like, People who want to be dispensational about things, which, again, is silly. But this kind of covers all of that. And um, verse number 14. This is the Apostle Paul. Well, I'll start reading verse number 12. You can show people this. He says, now this I say that every one of you saith, I am a Paul and I have Apollos and I have Cephas and I have Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius. Well, wait a minute. If you need baptism to be saved, then why is Paul saying, I thank God that I didn't baptize any of you? Wouldn't you be thanking God that I did baptize you because now you're finally saved because you got baptized? 
He says, lest any should say that I had baptized in mine own name, and I baptized also the household of Stephanus, besides I know not whether I baptized any other. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. God didn't send Paul to baptize. He sent him to preach the gospel, and the gospel is what's getting you saved. So that's a good, if you, if you run into people like that, just be like, well, what about this? What about God? Not, it, it, did he send people, Paul to get people saved or not? Good luck trying to convince me that he didn't send Paul to get people saved. Then why didn't he send him to baptize if, if baptism is required? That's just that's a great passage. And look, and if they're not going to receive that, then just forget them. Move on, because that is super clear. And don't waste your time arguing with someone. If, they, if they're going to look at that and still try to argue, they say, no, I still think baptism is required for salvation, then just, you know, tell them they're going to hell because they're not believing right and move on. I mean, the reason why you tell them they're going to hell because they're not believing right is to warn them. Because you don't want you don't want to walk away from people, letting them think that everything's just okay and that we believe almost the same. You know, no, it's not. You cannot believe that way and be saved and go to heaven. And the most loving thing you can do for people like that is just to be blunt and say you're not believing the scripture, and you're adding works of salvation. But that's a good a good reference to go to. So. Um, and don't let this creep in and or, or, or stay silent around it either. Paul didn't, and, and Barnabas didn't stay silent when people were trying to bring in circumcision. So we gave place to them, no, not for an hour. Say no. They disputed with them, and they, argued, they said, no, we, we know it's by grace through faith. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 5, Galatians 5. For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. You did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Adding one bit of works to grace makes the whole thing works. Saying the one little bit of leaven that you add, it leavens the whole lump. Adding one tiny bit of, of obedience to God's law added to salvation by grace through faith just makes it all works. The Bible says in Romans eleven six, 6, and if by grace, then is it no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. You can't have something that's undeserved have an element of your own merit added to it. Because then it's not grace anymore. If you deserve any part of it because you've worked for it, that's not grace by definition. But if it be of works, then is it no more grace, otherwise work is no more work. It can't be any mixture of the two. It's either one or the other. And grace, with any element of works, makes it all work. And work is all works, and you can't, you, you, you can't add grace to that. That's what we, I mean, that's, that's literally what Romans eleven six 6 is saying. It's one or the other. It's no longer work if it's grace, and it's no longer grace if it's works. Galatians 5, let's keep reading here, verse number 10. I have confidence in you through the Lord that ye will be none otherwise minded, but he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment whosoever he be. And I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased. So the offense of the cross is that it is finished. That is the offense, right? Because the world loves salvation by works. They love salvation by earning it on your own. You won't be persecuted by anyone out in the world by saying you go to heaven by doing good things and doing good to other people and, and, and loving everyone and doing all that. The world loves that message. There's no persecution for that. That's why the false prophets that are preaching that type of message, they're loved by the world. They're on TV. They're the famous people that everybody knows about and everybody loves that the world loves. There's no offense in that. For whatever reason, I mean, this is, it, it, it almost is, um, I mean, it, it has no sensibility to it that it's so offensive that salvation's a free gift. 
but it's true. The offense of the cross is easy. So, you know, the offense is that, hey, when Jesus Christ died on that cross, it's all like anything that you would need to do for salvation is done. It's completed what Jesus did for you. When he took the sins, when he nailed them to the cross, when he rose again from the dead, that's where the offense lies. The offense lies to other people. That's offensive. And I think one of the reasons why is because it's through Jesus Christ only. You have to go to him. You can't do it on your own at all. Everyone else wants to think they could do it themselves. I don't need anybody. I don't need God. I don't need Jesus. I could do it however I want to do it. They're offended that you have to submit yourself and go through Jesus. And I'm not saying submit yourself and, and doing all of, you know, keeping all of God's commandments. I'm saying submit yourself in humbling yourself and acknowledging and recognizing and trusting that he's the only way. There is no part you whatsoever. That is your submission. Giving up. I'm saying, I can't, I can't save myself. I need a savior. And putting your faith in him. That's what we need to do. And Paul's saying, look, if I'm preaching circumcision is required, the world's going to love that. Why am I being persecuted then? Because now I'm, I'm preaching Moses and the law. And all of his persecution came from the Jews who were saying he wasn't preaching the law and, he was, you know, and that's where all of his persecution came from. They're saying, you got to preach the law. So he's saying, if I taught circumcision, then why am I being yet persecuted? Then the offense of the cross has ceased. Verse number 12. I would they were even cut off which trouble you. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. You're saying, yeah, of course. We've been called unto liberty. We're free from, the, from the, the curse of the law. But don't just use that to go off and just sin and live a wicked lifestyle, obviously. He's saying, you know, Love, by love, serve one another. Do good and help people out. You've been free from the law, but still do what's right. Verse number 14, For all the laws fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And, you know, when Jesus was asked, you know, Master, what's the, the, the great commandment? And, um, and he said that to love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. He said, the second commandment is like unto it, to love your neighbor as yourself. On, all the, on these two new commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And the reason why that is, and, and this was kind of cutting it short and just saying that the law is fulfilled in one word, love thy neighbor as thyself. Because all of God's commandments on what we're not supposed to do are all things that are not loving to do. <laughs> so if you love someone, you're not going to steal from them. You're not going to murder them. You're not going to cheat on, their, you know, on, on your wife. You're not going to commit adultery with someone else's spouse. You're not going to want all their things. And, you know, like all of those things. Look, if you just loved your neighbor as yourself, then breaking any other aspect of God's law would, would, um, would go against that principle. And the reason why Jesus said both because there's, there's commandments about obeying God and worshiping God and not having other gods before you and then in how you deal with men. And that, those two principles cover, well, if you could follow those two things perfectly, you've got the rest of the law down. And these are good, these are good short phrases to just have memorized and to know and to keep with you. If you're ever wondering what's right and wrong, I mean, you can, if, you, if you're basing them off of these principles, you're going to do well. Should I divorce my spouse? Well, how loving is that? And don't try to twist that around to somehow be loving to, <laughs> to leave the person you vowed never to leave. Right? I mean, there's so many areas where you could just kind of try to apply that to honestly. And, and you should come to the, with, to the right conclusion. Um... Verse number 14, or verse number 15, but if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. He's talking to people he, he still ultimately believes are saved. You know, he's questioning them. It's not a good way to live. If you bite and devour one another, you're mean to each other, you're hostile to each other, 
You're going you're gonna to be consumed or destroyed of each other. It's just, that's just the way things are going to go. Verse 16, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the, lu the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. Now, just for sake of time, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip this part. I was gonna, I've already preached this relatively recently on this, this notion of when you're saved, you have a new spirit that's born inside of you. And the reason why I reject the teaching that, oh, if someone's sinning, then they're not saved anymore because they wouldn't go get drunk. They wouldn't do these things if they were really saved. Because they're completely ignoring what the Bible is saying right here is that you have the flesh and the spirit. When you're saved, you know, before you got saved, you always have the flesh. And that's why you could never please God because you never had faith. You never have the spirit to help guide you. But when you got saved, you have a spirit now that's born of God that will help you to go in the right path that will lead you to, to serve God and do what's right, but you still have the flesh. And as the Bible says, hey, these two are contrary the one to the other so that you cannot do the things that ye would. Would just means what you want to do, right? In our spirit, we want to do what's right. We want to please God. We want to go to church. We want to read our Bible. We want to pray. We want to help people out. We want to forsake all the stuff that we have in this world and just go out and help people out. In the spirit, that's what you want to do. But in the flesh, you want to go take a nap. In the flesh, you want to just go and indulge in things that feel good. In the flesh, you just want to keep eating so that you can't eat anymore. <laughs> in the flesh, you want to go and just get intoxicated. In the flesh, you want to commit fornication. These are the things you want to do in the flesh. Why? Because it just feels good physically to your body. And these are the things that prevent you from doing what's right, from being in the Spirit, from doing what God wants you to do. And we all have that. They're contrary to each other. And that's the reason why you cannot judge someone's salvation based on if they're still sinning because all that demonstrates to you is that they're in the flesh. It means they're walking in the flesh. It doesn't mean the Spirit is not there. Because the Bible says to quench not the spirit. It wouldn't tell you to do something if it wasn't possible to do it, right? Quenching, and quenching means, think about like quenching your thirst. What are you doing? You're eliminating your thirst. If you're real thirsty, you know, and it, you know, I have all these, these advertisers, Gatorade and stuff, like, like quench your thirst. It means, oh man, I'm super thirsty. I've just been working out. I'm going to drink this and my thirst is going to be gone. It's going to satisfy that. Well, when you quench the spirit, the spirit's trying to get you, hey, you should be doing this right. Hey, that's wrong. Don't do that. Quenching the spirit means you're, you're silencing and stopping that from, from leading you, right? And we don't want to do that. But I'll tell you what, it's possible. And I know from firsthand experience it's possible. After I got saved, there were things that that I knew were wrong according to Scripture. Even though I wasn't like super knowledgeable, I was raised in a Christian home and I knew enough about the Bible to know that like going out and partying and doing drugs and getting drunk, those are sins. And I didn't have to be able to show you exactly where it says that in the Bible. I knew it was wrong. There were a lot of things I knew that were wrong. But I did them anyways. Why? Because I was walking in my flesh. And, the more, and, and you know what? It did bother me. It bothered me to do things that I knew were wrong, but the longer you do them and the more you just try to, 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 to stop that, that bothering noise that you have in your head that's telling you you shouldn't be doing these things, you can force yourself to keep going because you're just walking in that flesh to start silencing that inner voice that's telling you not to do those things. Now, it doesn't go away permanently but you can quench that spirit. I did it for years. I know exactly what I'm talking about here. Unfortunately, and, and you know what? Take the Bible's word for it or take my word for it and don't, let, don't say you have to figure this out for yourself, right? Let's walk in the spirit. Let's mortify the deeds of the flesh. 
and let's strengthen our spirit so that our spirit can overcome our flesh instead of, our, you know, instead of feeding our flesh because the mo wh whichever one you're walking in more is going to be stronger. If you're walking in your flesh more, your flesh is in a way getting exercise and getting strengthened to, to lead you to do more walking in the flesh. But the more you're walking in the spirit, you're going to be strengthening your spirit. Your spirit's going to be getting worked out more. You're going to be doing more in the spirit. And the lusts of the flesh are going to be easier to put away because your spirit is getting stronger. Your spirit's will is, is, is getting that point to be like, all right, hey, I've got this. I don't want to do these other fleshly things anymore because I want to keep walking in the spirit. It doesn't happen just overnight. It requires work and it requires you to really have the will to, to mortify deeds of the flesh. But that's why the Bible says, hey, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. The two are completely opposite. If you're walking in the spirit, you won't sin. You won't sin. Now, we are still sinners. We are never always going to be walking in the spirit as long as we have this flesh. But let's maximize how much we're walking in the spirit because then we won't be sinning. You want to guarantee, you want, if you're struggling with sin, and this is the best thing that you do. If you're struggling with any type of sin, especially habitual sins, sins that you do, you know, I mean, smoking, overeating, or, you know, drinking, whatever. There's always times when those sins take place. Replace that time when you would have to do those things with something spiritual, with something where you will be walking in the spirit. Force yourself to do it. Force yourself to remove whatever it is and just be like, instead of watching this TV show, instead of going out to a bar, instead of, you know, God forbid, you know, turning on pornography or whatever, whatever it is, right? I mean, I, fill in the blank. Replace that with, you know, when, 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 when that desire, that fleshly lust comes on you, just be like, no, I'm going to pull out my pocket Bible and just, I'm going to read this instead. I'm going to start off praying to God to strengthen me and I'm going to do something spiritual to get me walking in the Spirit so I don't fulfill those lusts of the flesh. This is, the Bible's true. Walk in the Spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. That's a promise. So that, that's something to keep in mind. Now your flesh is going to keep telling you, no, don't do that. That's boring. You don't want to do that. Feel good. Indulge. But that's, that's, that's the overcoming. That's, the, that's what we have to do. So just remember these words and keep those in mind. Uh, I'm going to skip. You could, it, to, to look into that subject an, um, more thoroughly, I was going to turn to Romans 7. If you want to make a note of that, you can look at that later. Talking about the difference between the flesh and the spirit. Great passage explaining that. First John chapter 3 also goes uh, pretty in-depth about the new man versus the old man. Um, 1 John 3 and Romans chapter 7. But I'm going to skip all that. Let's, keep, let's finish up Galatians chapter 5, verse number 18. But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. And this is what I was talking about earlier. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, you have this huge list, and there's things that I'm sure you've been guilty of in this, because these are all works of the flesh. This is what your flesh wants you to do. These are all sins. These are all things against God's word. And walking in the flesh will manifest itself in one of these ways. So just remember that when, you, when, you're, when you're not, and, and think about it, when you're not walking in the spirit, you are in the flesh. You're either walking in one or the other. You're either walking in the spirit or you're walking in the flesh. So be mindful of that as well. The less you are choosing to walk in the spirit, all of these things are way more likely now to come up because you're walking in the flesh. So as much as is possible, I mean, be praying in your mind throughout the day, doing, you know, doing things that's going to help keep you in the spirit. Because these, this is what will manifest 
as a lust of the flesh. Now, I've covered this in other sermons as well, but, but um, we don't need to be... Um, obviously, he's saying for a very good reason, they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God, right? It's very strong language again, saying, hey, this is what people who go to hell do. It's not for you, believer or Christian, to be doing these things. But the language I usually say, well, what do you mean? They which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And it's in, I, I believe it's in, um, where's the parallel passage for this? Ephesians or in Colossians that explains that, you know, you did all these things, that, that people do this, do not inherit the kingdom of God, but you are washed, you are sanctified, you are justified. So, you are no longer, you know, in, in Revelation 21a, it says, you know, but the unbelieving and, and fearful, you know, fearful and unbelieving, and abominable, and murderers, sorcerers, uh, whoremongers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part. I say, well, if you lie, you're a liar. But what, what removes us from that condemnation is that because Christ has cleansed us, you're no longer a liar, you're no longer a drunkard, you're no longer a murderer or whatever, because all of that has been put away from you. God has separated your sins as far as the east is from the west. So you no longer are classified as one of those types of people spiritually. So spiritually as well, we will walk in the spirit. The spirit does not do these, does not manifest itself in this fleshly way. So um, th that's, that's why he's saying that, you know, they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Well, our, our flesh isn't going to inherit the kingdom of God either. Our spirit will, though. But the fruit of the Spirit, verse number 22, is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Those are great things. I mean, think about having all of those attributes in your life. Day in and day out, you have love, you have joy, you have peace how enjoyable your life would just be overall. These are fruits of the Spirit. So when you're walking in the Spirit, the Spirit will help to reproduce these things in your life. Another motivation to walk in the Spirit because, hey, this is, this is gonna, you'll be able to get through everything in your life if you choose to walk in the Spirit because the Spirit will give you joy. The Spirit will give you peace, inner peace, the Spirit will give you, you know, all, all these good things because you're walking in the Spirit. It says in verse 24, And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. And that's where he's making a difference. You know, you live in the Spirit because you have the Spirit, because you're born again. Let's choose now to walk in the Spirit. So you can have the Spirit and not walk in the Spirit. Otherwise, this verse wouldn't make any sense. We have the Spirit. We live in the Spirit. Let's also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. So let's not, you, you know, when we do good works for God and everything else, let's not get caught up in vain glory, vanity, or you know, things that, that we're just bringing attention on ourselves and glory in our own good works and everything like that. You know, let's just do everything for the glory of God. Not for our own glory, 2 Corinthians 2, 12 says, 10, 12, excuse me, says, For we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. When you start comparing yourself with other believers, and oh, I'm doing this, and you know, you're only doing this, you know, that's not wise. Don't bring vain glory on yourself. We ought to do things for the glory of God. Uh, 2 Corinthians 10, 17 says, But he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. For not he that commendeth himself is approved, but whom the Lord commendeth. If you really want to have honor or glory at all, you cannot bring that upon yourself. And, and you're just going to come across as an arrogant fool when you start bringing all this attention on yourself. You're going to be seen by everyone else as, as proud. And you're not going to be getting any glory anyways. So you're going to be shooting yourself in the foot by trying to get attention on you and being desirous of vain glory. But when you have a humble, meek spirit and you do things because you want to serve God, 
and you have sincerity in your heart, and you say, you know, it's not about me, it's about Jesus, I want to point these people to Christ, and when you have that type of a lowly, meek, humble attitude and spirit, and you're doing works for that in mind, you're going to magnify Christ first and foremost, which is your goal, but then also God will lift you up, and people will see that, and, and you'll gain respect that you're not even looking for because you're trying to do what's right in God's eyes, and God will, will lift you up, but See, it only works and it's only valuable if God's the one lifting you up. When you try to lift yourself up, it doesn't work. It's going to fail. So let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for all the great teachings that we can get from your word. Lord, I, I pray that you would please just um, help us all to win the, the struggle, the battle over our flesh on a regular basis, dear God, on a daily basis. Help us to bear our cross and to follow you, dear Lord. Help us to walk in the spirit that we know that we have and uh, help us to mortify the deeds of the flesh. It's not always easy, Lord, but just help us to be mindful. Bring to remembrance these scriptures that we saw tonight as well as, as other scriptures, Lord, that will help us to gain the strength to do that which is right. Dear God, please bless our church. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.